The reason we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the railroad is today, railways kind of seem like something that belonged to our grandparents. And maybe some of us might think they're not so relevant to our lives today, except when we're stuck at a crossing watching the graffiti colored cars roll by. Um, but you know, the railway was really crucial to Pemberton's development. Without the railway, there wouldn't have been schools or businesses. Uh, it would have been impossible to move freight in and out of the valley. And it would have been impossible to sell your farm products. So the railway really ensured permanent settlement in Pemberton. And we think that that's an anniversary to celebrate. Now the railway also connected a lot of communities together and we all felt a little bit closer when the trains were, the passenger trains were running between the communities. And there was quite a sense of family with the people that worked for the railroad and a lot of them were familiar faces. So we're really excited that Roy Croston could come and visit with us and talk to us about his memories of working for the railroad. Roy started working for the railroad in 1961. So he worked for the railroad for over 40 years. He worked for the Pacific Great Eastern Railway, BC Rail, and CN. And he just retired in 2005. So I think also uh, Roy's father worked for the railroad. And he grew up in the section house in Pemberton that was located next to the Pemberton Hotel. Yeah, now I think that would have been a different kind of upbringing than you would have gotten living on a farm. So I thought that's where we'd start off. And I'd ask you, Roy, to tell us what was it like growing up in the section house of Pemberton? Was it an exciting place? <laughs> well, folks, it actually was an exciting place. It, uh, I first came here when I was four years old. What's your last name? Croston. Yeah, I remember you when you were. <laughs> And we actually, we lived in Pemberton here from 47 to 53, and then we came back again 57 to 59. My father was a section foreman and moved up and down the line, yeah, wherever the work was, and uh, family with him. But living in the section house here at Pemberton, it was fairly dull downtown. There was not much of a downtown in those days. I went to start school here in 1949, and a little one-room schoolhouse which was just up behind the Pemberton Hotel, uh, where the BC Hydro Houses are now. It's called BC Electric then, I believe. Well, it, it's the, it's the uh, dis typing district office right behind the hotel. That was, that was the little school that house? That was the school. That's where it was. And it was a jail, jail part-time school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, partake of the jail time, but uh, <laughs> I, remember the I can remember the little schoolhouse. I also remember it was a... Uh, it was a little one-room school house and had a little, uh, I believe it was coal stove and uh, one of the older boys in class at that time during the winter went up on the roof one time and sat on the chimney and smoked us all out. He sat there and we had, we had an instant fire drill. That kind of perturbed the teacher, but <laughs> that's the way things were then. Um, some of the other things we did here in that time was, uh, I remember there was a swimming hole, and it wasn't One Mile Lake, it was so over here, uh, just Island. by Vinyl Village. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And on, on Harrow Road. On Harrow Road. Yeah. I remember there was a swimming hole there, and I can remember always finding uh, large pumice stones there. Yeah. We could find pumice stones like this big around that weighed 15 pounds, yeah. maybe. Yeah, no, it's, really still, strong. it's still there. Yeah, it's, but the, I think most of the pumice has been picked out. Yeah, right? oh yeah, just the leeches are left. Yeah. <laughs> Just the leeches. And uh, after we went to school here in the uh, one room house, uh, later we uh, had the Quonset hut out yeah. a mile out of town. Yeah. Was, we had to walk to school a mile. Tough. Mm. Uphill both ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> Winter and summer. Where was it? Where was Quonset? Quonset. 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 Oh, by Collins Road. It's oh, out. Okay. That's the old high school. The old high school. The old, the old high, high school. school. Oh, uh, when it first was a school up there, it was just a two room. Oh, 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 oh. And, they, two and they were there until they just took it down. Yeah. Yeah. Quonset Huts. The Quonset Huts were still there when they took the whole Five thing down. And the Quonset Hut was the original school. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they were just built oh. in. So I, I knew a few of the people actually. I met Rosemary Rowan again today. She was one of my classmates here at that yeah. time, grades yeah. eight and nine. And uh, 
it was it was good times. The Deckers, the Rosses, the Millers, yeah. um, Taylors, Rollins. And so it must have been uh, quite a lot of activity around your house when the train came to town. When the train <laughs> came to town, it was fairly busy. Yes, <laughs> fairly busy. Everybody went down to see the train because what else was there? To do? There was no highway. Was there was the no main, highway. Main entertainment. Main entertainment. Yes. Uh, Campfires, like the caveman TV was the other <laughs> one. But, um, and uh, I also remember working in the co op building as a 14 year old uh, lifting 100 pound sacks of potatoes. That's how the potatoes went in and out of the valley here. Was, and that's the animal barn today. Pardon me? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the animal barn. But uh, yeah, things have definitely changed around here, although the weather hasn't. Uh, in 1948, uh, May 24th weekend of 1948, my father was a section foreman here, and uh, he said it was 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the year that one of the big floods here. That was after yeah, the 1947 yeah. heavy snows. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sections, another thing about the section house, two-story section house, one night in 1950, 51, we had a five foot snowfall overnight. Wow. Just from supper time till breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, five feet. And I can remember jumping out of the second story window of the <laughs> section house into the <laughs> snow. No, yeah. That was entertainment. Was the train, uh, was passenger and freight? Passenger and freight, yes. And would it come in? How many, how many times would it come in? Uh, the, the train, the passenger train was daily. Oh, uh, freight trains were daily, uh, but they were much smaller than they are now. But this was before the bud car. Oh, this was before the bud car, yes. Yeah. It was what, a mixed, yeah. mixed freight, yes. Yeah. Sometimes they'd be mixed even with stock cars. They'd have, yeah. If you wanted to get a train over the road quickly, there was still it was a passenger train, but you put stock cars on it too oh, with the cattle. Where did they put the cattle? Right behind the locomotive. The smell went back into the Yay! train cars. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were still cold. Um, our, Pardon me? The, the train was still steam. Uh, it, was ste it was steam, but not when I was, it was steam while I was here as a child. When I heard on 61, steam had finished here. Yeah. Except we did have the Royal Hudson yeah. and the 3716, which yeah. is the port of Port Coquitlam engine. I have some good pictures of it here, right here in Pemberton. Because when I first came, it was steam. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when it was steam, you had the water tanks along yeah. the way, like out of Squamish. You had a water, out of Squamish, you had a water tank at Water Tank, which is the Black Tusk uh, yeah. Pinecrest subdivision now. I actually lived, my father was actually a section foreman there when I was three years old. Water tank. And that's all it was there with the water tank and a section house. And a tool house, that's it. Wow. <laughs> and a lot of burnt trees. By and a lot of burnt the trees by the one photo there, yeah. It looked like it, I don't remember the fire or anything, I was too young then. But, uh, uh, but these water tanks, anyway, you had to. The steam engines had to water up. Uh, yeah, we had a water tower here. Too. We had a water tower here, right where the crossing is. Right yeah. I have a picture here of 1949. This is Pemberton, 1949. Mm -hmm. That's, That's your station and the water tank. And the water yeah. tank is right where that uh, crossing is now. Yeah. yeah. And then after this water tank went down, they also had put in a steam pipe, a sand pipe we called it, just south of where the station is. Yeah. It's gone now too. They, it fed from a flume from One Mile Creek. Yeah. That used to be another one of our activities when we were young. Was used to hike up to the falls on One Mile Creek. Mm -hmm. On a hot day. On a hot day or a cold day. We do it any time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was nothing else to do. Well, it was actually everybody thinks it's because my father worked on the railway. My father didn't even know I hired on the railway. What happened was when we moved to Squamish in 1961. This is after living in Quinell for a couple of years. Um, I was going by the station in Squamish this one day, and, and the agent, the station agent, he says, Rory, the railway's hiring trainmen. Are you interested? I said, sure. I was 18 years old. And uh, he said, okay, come by tomorrow. The superintendent will be there. And you can talk to him. So I went by, and the superintendent, a fellow by the name of Lauren McNamee, he says, how old are you, kid? I said, 18. He says, too damn young. That was it. No more said. So that was fine. The next day, the station agent calls me up and he says, Roy, the superintendent left you a rule book to write. He says, you write your rules and you're hired on the railway. I wrote my rules, I ended up in the midnight yard of Prince George. <laughs> just like that. And I stayed, I just, 
put in 43 years there. I never intended to be a railroader, and uh, it just you, was a fluke. Didn't and you mention you saw your dad? I saw my dad. He was actually up at Prince George at that time working with an extra gang. Uh -huh. And uh, I went by on a freight, and I waved at him <laughs> up at Prince George, and he wondered, what the heck? And he found out later that I'd hired on a railroad. <laughs> he didn't even know. <laughs> so things are strange, but it, it was a very, it, it was a good living, a good uh, job. Uh, we were on call 24 hours a day with a two hour notice, and this was prior to cell phones. Mm -hmm. So that was a little difficult. And when you were what we call a junior man, you got the dirty end of the stick. When I hired all these five man crews, you had an engineer, a fireman, even though we'd gone to diesel, we still had a fireman. And you had a head end brakeman, which was the junior man, rode the locomotive. Not a very good seat either because it was a little piano stool behind the fireman. So you're trying to see through the fireman. And uh, then you had a conductor and a tail end brakeman, or a rear brakeman. From that five man crew, we've gone down to two man crews. You have just the conductor on the head end now with the locomotive engineer. No yeah. cabooses. Could you tell us for me that uh, isn't familiar with all the different jobs on a railroad? What does a conductor do? What does an engineer do? Who is the section man? What is a section? Okay, a section <laughs> foreman is what my father was. A section man, section foreman, and they had a section of track that was 12 miles long. Generally, it, the railroad was broken up into 12 mile sections, and each piece had a section. It was a Squamish section, Chequemus section, Garibaldi section. Water Tank section, Alta Lake section, Green River section, Pemberton section, Birkin section, Darcy, and uh, Shalalf. We actually lived in Shalalf, which is Bridge River. And uh, that's how it went. And they were, they were in charge of that chunk of track, maintenance-wise. Ties, rails, make sure the gauge is good, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. On the train crews, you had the conductor who was in charge. He was the one that told the locomotive engineer when he could move. An engineer cannot start an engine and move it without a signal from somebody, a trainman or a conductor. And that was just, uh, it's funny that nobody ever really got hurt because you had to, well they shouldn't say that, but they did get hurt, some did, but nowadays if you want to make a local, if you want to do anything on a train, you want to go in between it to do up a hose bag or anything, you have to get the engineer, you have to tell them you tell him what you're doing, and he has to give a thing like set and centered or three point protection before you go in there. And you have to, before you do any of that. In, the, in our days, all we did was we just gave up, everything was hand signals. This is before radios. Mm -hmm. We did all the hand signal, we did it all from the tops of cars. Because that's the only way you could see. You could stand on the top of the car next to the locomotive. That was the head end man's job. He, the tail end man, would be partly down the string of cars and the conductor would be at the far end and you just relay the signals over the top. You could do it all around curves that way. Now it's all radio. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is different, definitely changed. The trains are much uh, longer now. The cars, at those times, 40 foot was a standard car. Now most of the cars are minimum 60 feet long. Mm -hmm. And that was prior to the graffiti too. When you mentioned the graffiti, it, it's amazing what's on some of those cars now. Now, how does a conductor keep everything running smoothly? <coughs> or does it so, run smoothly? It, it, <laughs> usually, it usually runs pretty smoothly. The, most of the crews, especially on PG and BC Rail, they get along really good. It was like a big family. When it went to CN, there was an instant change because of management, I think. Because they thought, well, their biggest problem, they had quite a few problems as soon as they took over with derailments and that. They tried to run the trains. They don't have the grades we have here. Like going out of Pemberton here, you're climbing 2.2% grade up to Mons, yeah. which means that every 100 feet, you're rising 2.2 feet. That's a steep railway grade. If you turned a car loose just by gravity, like took the handbrakes off a car that's sitting on a grade like that, within a half a mile, it'll be up to 60 miles an hour. That actually happened. A car got away from Tisdale one time. Loaded, they were loading scrap up there in Tisdale, and it went off at the curve just by the Green River Falls there. It was literally airborne. Wow. Just at two miles. I'm surprised it made it that far. But. <laughs> <laughs> the lengths of the trains uh, have changed, and you were also talking about the lengths of the road stop. Yes, the cars. Through the years. 
Yes, from 40 foot cars up to, they're up about 60 now. A lot of flat cars now are 80 feet long. And those container flats, now we, we don't have containers here. You've probably seen them on the main lines. The only reason we don't have container cars here is the tunnels in Chequemus Canyon Aren't are not high enough. Oh. Not high enough. Plus, I don't know whether those container trains would like all the curvature we have. This Squamish subdivision from Squamish to Lillooet has tremendous curvature. We have two separate mountain grades because you climb from, when you come out of Squamish northbound, you climb from Chequemus all the way up to just south of Whistler. Mm -hmm. And you come across the top, you get to Mons, you drop down into Pemberton here. Like at Whistler, we're up at 2,200 feet. Yeah. Here at Pemberton, you're 690. Wow. Then you climb up to Burke at 1,800 yeah. out of Mount Curry. You drop down to Darcy, which is just over 700. You go around both those lakes into Lillooet. And then you climb for 30 miles out of Lillooet up to Kelly Lake, 3,300 feet above sea level. That's hard to operate. Mm -hmm. It's that's why we always had the. I don't think people remember the pusher engines that used to mm -hmm. sit yeah. yeah. that we have. They used to run north to Darcy, pick up all the southbound trains. Didn't have to push northbound because on PGE BC Rail, all the revenue was moving south. It was mainly trains northbound were empty. You didn't need didn't need pushers. But what you couldn't do is you couldn't run more than 80 cars empty without remote engines because the curvature you just streamline the train. Uh, Power and yeah, just, just straighten them right out. Off into the Chequemus River they went. That's what happened with the CN. Oh. They, they tried to run a 143 yeah. car train and just straightened it out. Why right did the they river. The was off? Uh, that was a oh. yeah economic thing. Because oh, so when sad. I first hired on, we had the wooden cabooses where the crews, the conductor of the crew, there was a conductor, tail end brakeman, head end brakeman, that was a, what we call a pool crew. And we ha each conductor had his own caboose. So when you got into Lowell, which was a terminal, they'd have to switch the cabooses off. So they got away from that. They went to what we called run-through cabooses. That was the steel ones. When we had those uh, what we called pool cabooses, we'd take that caboose off. And that was our accommodation while we were in Lowell. Well, an old wooden caboose sitting in Lowell at 40 degrees <laughs> Celsius, either direction, minus 40 or plus 40. It was not a great place to try and get a day's no. sleep for the night and run back, but no. that's the way it was. And uh, then we went to... When Roy and I were talking, he mentioned <coughs> that in Lillooet, um, fellows liked the night shift in Lillooet over the day shift. Just because of that climb way. up to right. Kelly Lake. Oh, I see. Yeah, when you started to climb up, <laughs> if you've got an afternoon shot out of yeah. Lillooet going north, which I did the summer of 62, I worked out of Lillooet, and... Uh, that was a hot, hot year, and you just go to work about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 14 o'clock for the initiated, yeah. uh, and uh, you got the engines wide open. We'd have five locomotives, five diesel locomotives on the head end, wide open, eighth notch, for 30 miles, about an hour and 15 minutes, and some kind of hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The heat just baking off the side of the mountain, engines oh, wide open. Be quite obsessed with the time. Quite obsessed with their watches. Um, our watches, we had to have them inspected uh, by a watch inspector every, I think it was every three months, but the watch could not lose more than 30 seconds in a month. Couldn't vary more than 30 seconds, which is one second a day. And the reason time was so important was when trains were running against one another, you were working on it, he, he was what we call a time card train, especially the passenger trains. So the passenger train would do here in Pemberton northbound, it was 11.09 was his time here. If we were coming south on a freight against that passenger train, he's due here at 11.09, we have to be off the main line by 11.04. You have to five minutes to clear a train going the other way. And that's why it was very important that your watch is, because if you didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. that was close, so. Yeah, five minutes, well you have to be in to clear at that time. Oh, okay. So you have to have your whole train off the main track at that time. Still, but that's, still, that's yeah, yeah. That's why not watches were very. In, yeah, it's not a lot of difference. So you had to check your watch. They had each station had a clock there that you had, and it had to be checked regularly. And you had to coincide your watch with that clock when you went to work. You were telling us earlier now you had your own instance. Yeah, we had our own instance. This one was a little different. It wasn't because time. It was because a, a train order meet. 
I was on a freight, we were coming south, we were just north of Burke, and <clears throat> January was the year, January 1971, and luckily it was January because there's no leaves on the trees, and we're coming up the hill to Burke to meet the passenger train, the northbound passenger train. And the crew on the northbound passenger train, we had train orders saying, number 46, meet number one at Burke. Very straightforward. We're number 46, the way through. And uh, I'm talking to Bill Hales, our engineer, and I'm, I'm talking to Bill, and all of a sudden his eyeballs just went, when I'm looking at him, and I look ahead, and there's a headlight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Adrenaline sets right in. I got out of this local, I got out of the seat in the, on the brakeman side, out the back door of the engine behind Bill, and I'm standing on the ground on the head. Adrenaline. Nobody got hurt in that one except the baggage went on the butt car who was a fellow by the name of Warren McNamee, the superintendent who had hired me. He jumped out and cut his uh, nose on a crust of the snow. Oh. Oh. And I said, Warren, you okay? And he said, yeah, what a hell of a way to spend your 52nd birthday. He said, four guys, the engineer, who had over, he had about 40 years experience, and there was Bud and Warren and a fellow by the name of Dick Steininger. They all had a minimum 30 years experience each. They all forgot about the meat. It was right there. Meet the 46th Burke. Yeah. So then, now if something like that happens, right away you're off to trauma mm -hmm. or something. Not to us. Uh, when we hit, uh, we wrecked the lead locomotive on our train, broke all the air pipes and that so we couldn't move. The motors fell off the bud car when the force of the explosion, all the motor mounts dropped and the bud cars dropped right there. The motors dropped right between the rails. So we got that all wired up pushed them back to Birkin. What did they do? They took our crew, because we were in the right. They said, okay, you guys haul the one car crew and the passengers to Lola. And they took the other crew out of service. But that's the kind of trauma counseling we got at that time. Yeah. They just left you back to work. I mean. yeah. But that's, uh, that was one of my little uh, escapades. Another little escapade we had was in the Squamish yard, and this was in 1985. We were switching the yard in Squamish, and at that time you had yard limits. And what that meant in yard limits, trains had to go through yard limits at a speed that would allow them to stop within one half the range of vision. The only thing the yard limits didn't apply to was passenger trains. So there again, you had the time card, you knew what time the train, that passenger train was due in your town, you have to be in the clear five minutes prior to that. But this one, this freight train come in, we're switching, and he's running a little early. We're pushing about 22 six cars a pole in the yard. Luckily, we're going the same direction. He come in with a 10,000 ton train and hit us. We derailed three, four locomotives, about 12 cars of sulfur, and this all happened right by the railway park in Squamish on that curve right at the north end of the railway park. Luckily, it happened on a curve because that took away all the momentum of the, if it had it been straight yeah, on, everything would have gone up in the air. Stuff did go up in the air all right, but it pushed up sideways. Nobody got hurt. Nice. That's the yard engine, what it looked like after, sitting crossways on the rail, and it was, a, it was just, that was human error again. The crew did not obey yard limits. Luckily, again, it wasn't us. It was the other crew. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But in your career, you were saying there weren't as many accidents as really now. Looking back, you're thinking, wow, it's amazing to work more. Yes, yes, because I was like 43 years out there going up and down the track. So, well, and all the way, because I had the seniority, I could bid on the better jobs, getting all those. Uh, Charter jobs. Like I actually took the Premier of British Columbia, it was with Rita Johnson at the time. We did a three-day business trip, and we took her to uh, Prince George with all the news media, like Vaughn Palmer from the Sun and Brian Kieran of the Province and stuff like that. That was a that was a good trip. I have a picture of that one too. Uh, the crew. Where did you, where were you when those came? Uh, the, uh, the one over here. The, yeah. Um, Farm road there. I think I was up in Prince George then. Because I worked out of Prince George, I worked out of Quinnell. No, I like also worked Adam, the. Pardon me? That was like an atom bomb. Nothing. Oh, yes. Yeah, so what, what happened? That car actually went on the ground at Mount Curry. Yeah. And then when it hit the switch at the little yeah. Uh, yeah. shingle mill spur yeah. there, yeah. there was a beehive burner there and the propane went kaboom. What year was that? 
I'm not sure. I think the early, early 60s. 63? 60, oh, okay. 67, 67. That late? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was 65, 67, somewhere in there. Was Joe Antonelli donated 67, a photo that he took of church. the mushroom classic. Wow. Yeah, was, I, was, I, I was sitting in the, in the science room at the high school and all of a sudden the window started to shake like crazy and we looked out the window and there was like an atom bomb just went up and like mushroom. mushroom. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wasn't in Pemberton when that happened, but I'm familiar. Well, Pemberton's a good snow belt, as anybody that's lived here for a while knows. <laughs> but uh, one of the... You used to, not anymore. No, it's not as bad now. But uh, we spent one night in the Chequemus Canyon. We were going down, it was uh, January, I believe it was 72. We were going down on the way freight down through McGuire. And that, McGuire's a heavy snow belt too, Brandywine area. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was nice, dry snow was just flying over the front of the locomotive and the conductor he calls up to us we have radios in and he says Bill he says I can only see one rail back here behind us and Bill says that's one more that we can see up here he says <laughs> <laughs> oh great <laughs> yeah. end of conversation so we're sifting down through this nice powdery snow and we get down south of Garibaldi and it changes from dry snow to wet snow and we go into this rock cut and we go into snow about six feet deep and we just, it just lifts the traction motors of the locomotives up off, right. off, off the track. So the wheels are sitting about this. We didn't derail or anything, but it lifts them up about a quarter inch. You have no more traction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The snow is right level with the cab windows. And we <laughs> sat there from about 18 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock at night. I think it was about 6 o'clock in the morning before we got out of there. There was three snow plows working that day on the Squamish sub. That's how bad the snow was. They had three cloud crews out. Wow. And that's when they had the silver thaw in Squamish, the freezing rain. Mm -hmm. And it lasted probably 20 hours. Usually a freezing rain lasts an hour. Not this one. It took down power lines. Mm -hmm. Brackendale was, was with it. 72. Oh, Brackendale I was... That. I lived in Squamish then. I remember it. Brackendale yeah. was without power for a week. Yeah. I remember that storm. That ice storm. Ice storm. Yeah, it was a nice storm. Long ice storm. Yeah, it was a long, long, <laughs> long and the adventures along the lake. When we did let one phenomenon we did have when we lived in Shalal in 1956 was that Seton Lake froze. Oh. It froze over. Literally. That was all the first the time in the world. Hmm? That was the first time. I yes, it was. And we actually skated to Lillooet. Oh, I don't cool. think it's been done since then. And people that lived there couldn't remember before. It was just a, it was really, it, yeah, it was turned down to about minus. 20, I guess, but no wind. So the lake stayed calm for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Usually when the ice started, you'd get a wind and to break it up. This time it stayed calm for, must have been three weeks, and the lake just froze like glass. Oh, nice. It was hell, yeah, it was hell playing hockey though, because when you shot the puck, like you it kept from ear to. <laughs> yeah, I was only 13 years old. Yeah, you missed your pass, it was two and a half miles to get yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you go. Literally, literally, it was like glass. But it's never been that way since. Mainly because it, you need perfect weather conditions yeah. for that to happen. And it, we happen to have part of the air conductor. If you have a, a good people skills, passenger trains were great places mm -hmm. to work. You used to get some really odd questions, mm -hmm. but uh, like how many times a day do you do this job, you know, that not knowing that it's already a 10 hour day, you know, like how many times a day do you do it? <laughs> but uh, I worked quite a few charters that way, and that's where I got quite a few pictures. I'd get back from charters, people would take pictures and then send them to me. I got some good pictures that way. Uh, the hardest part uh, of tra being a trainman, I guess, well, even a conductor now, because you're the only person that's out on the ground, is if when the train goes into emergency, when you lose your air, the train goes, usually that's a, what we call a hose bag. That's between each car, the train line, that's your air for your brakes on every car. And if those part, you're into emergency. Mm -hmm. So if when first thing that happens after you go into emergency is you pick up a pipe wrench, a hose bag, your radio, your lamp, your parka, and off you go. And you take a pen and a piece of paper because you don't know you might be derailed. When you get back there, you've got to write down car numbers. Pretty hard to remember if there's 10 or 12 cars on the ground. Because that's the first thing your dispatcher wants to know, your mm -hmm. rail traffic controller. But uh, how things have changed since I hired on was uh, 
when we had the caboose and the head end, when something happened on a 50, <coughs> well, even a 40 car train would be a big train now. And uh, you only have to go 20 car lengths from each direction to, before Figure you find it. Yeah. Now the trains are 100 cars long and you're going from one direction. Mm. You, it's probably the 98th car. Yeah, yeah. It's got something wrong. <laughs> yes, quite likely. And then you have to fix it and walk all the way back. And the reason you take the hose bag and the wrench with you is because 99% of the time it's a train. And you just hope it's not, but yeah, it's just come apart. But if it has come apart, you better wire it together while you're back there because the next sharp curve you go around, maybe the... Mm -hmm. just Brass light incidents that you've heard of. I've heard of? I know, I know of one big one actually, just, just south of Pemberton here. I don't know how many people have ever walked down from the Nairn Falls Crossing and come north. They talked about the big rock there. Is anybody familiar with that big rock that's laying right beside the railway track there? And I'm talking big, like it's as big as this room. And it come down off the mountain and it hit the roadbed and we moved it over. over. My father was a section farmer. It didn't land on the track. It just, so they had to reline all the track around there. The, the rock's too big to move and they didn't even blow it. They didn't blast it. It's still there. And it's only about 200, wouldn't even be 200 yards from the crossing if you're driving up towards Nairn Falls. Right hand side and back towards Pemberton on the high side of the track. This was in the 50s, I believe. Another bad spot for rocks is right at Nairn Falls. They used to call that the 54 mile. Park. So are you telling us all to floor it through the crossing then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in case. No, well, there's some big rock and it came from a long ways back. I remember Dad telling me that he could see the path through, it cut through the trees. This That's why. Suicide Hill is called Suicide Hill because it kept sliding. Yeah, the that's right. Fill the tracks. Yeah, fill the tracks down. The and the road road's would road's always be like that. this instead of like that. That's yeah, that's one thing you don't want to hit the curve for the elevation the wrong way. You're going. <laughs> <laughs> You're going oh, on no. the ground. Um, Trevor Mills had talked about a phenomenon where the tracks would kink. That's in sun. Yeah, this kind of weather is great for that. <clears throat> so explain that. The rail expands and it has nowhere to go, so it's got to kick sideways. So you can get some pretty terrific sun kinks. That's so what we call sun kinks. On a straight stretch. It usually happens on a straight stretch. But it can happen in a curve, but what it'll do is just push the whole curve up. And it can happen right underneath your train, which can be a little hairy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're on the caboose, the engineer went through the curve, okay, and you're on the caboose, all of a sudden your caboose goes like this sideways. <laughs> you stay on the track. But you say, what the hell was that? And you look back and there's the track behind you like a When pretzel. it cools, does it straighten? Or? Uh, not usually. So you have to replace that they, section of rail? No, what they do, yeah, the, the section crew goes up there and very carefully they cut the rail because there's still a lot of tension on it. Yeah, then yeah. we can take a six inch piece out of the rail and then uh, put it back in. Yeah. Now they have what we call CWR, continuous welded rail. And they're put down, laid down in quarter mile sections. I don't know if you've ever seen the rail train around town. It goes through here now and again. Those are quarter mile length rails. Railway never went to metric. We stayed with miles. That 95 sign you see by Pemberton yeah, there, that's 95, 95 miles from North Vancouver. Yeah. <clears throat> and you said that it changed all the numbering? Yes, when they went to, that used to be the 57 mile. Pemberton used to be the 57 mile. But they had to change all the miles when they went south from uh, Squamish to North Vancouver. They had to add 38 miles in there. Like, yeah, like the hill in, in Mount Creek, they call it 62 hill. Or... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's the 99 mile now. Yeah. Best memories, I think, were actually just going to work every day. Every day was different. Uh, even though you were running over the same track, the weather made different scenery. And this was a beautiful subdivision to work. Because if you're working on North Vancouver, you're going around House Sound, then you have the Chequamish Canyon, you got the lakes up top, come down into Pemberton, and then you got Anderson, Seton Lake. It was just beautiful scenery. People pay, well, Rocky Mountain Year, they charge something like $1,900 a trip for that. Wow. And I did it every day. Yeah, yeah. For nothing. I got paid for it. You got paid for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you got to do a lot of excursions. I got to do excursion trains. Uh, we used to do a nine-day excursion up to Fort Nelson with passengers. First off, they did it with bud cars, and then we did it with a, a locomotive, the 4069 that's in the railway park at Squamish, and coaches. 
and we went up, ran up to uh, Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, Dawson Creek. Nice. I've been into Tumbler Ridge, the coal mines. That was a beautiful set of track. I never worked that subdivision other than when I was working, like I said, a, sp a Sperry car is a car that does uh, uh, magnetic induction in the rail, check flaws in the rail. I've worked those things, and I've worked one from North Vancouver to Prince George, and if you think it takes a while, it, you're literally moving only maximum 10 miles an hour. So 466 miles at 10 miles an hour takes you a few days. But it's, it's interesting because you can get off, catch up with the thing, because if he found something wrong, he'd have to come back, mark the track, stuff like that. I well, lived it. in Squamish. Oh, okay. And uh, that's why I didn't work the Royal Hudson, because the Royal Hudson ran from North Vancouver to Squamish yeah. and back, so I would have had to have drive, driven from Squamish into North Vancouver, right. got the train, done that trip, and then drove back from North Vancouver to Squamish. Didn't make sense. No. So I used to try and work jobs out of Squamish, and there were right. some good jobs out of Squamish. Yeah. That's why I also didn't work the regular bud cars, because it was the same thing. You'd work a 12, 14 hour day on the bud cars, north down to Lolo and back, and then drive back home to Squamish. Yeah, it's long. Lots of the fellows did. Lots of the, wow. lots of the conductors that were on those bud cars lived in Squamish. I don't know if anybody remembers the old log trains that they used to haul before the logging trucks no, no. went in. Yeah. Poles. No, no, Pardon me? No. They used to do poles. Yeah, we used to do poles out of the pole yard over there at Mount Curry. We used to switch those, pick those up with the wave freight. We've hauled up poles out of there 120 feet long. Wow. Unbelievable pace. They're, they're lined up in a bundle, um, cradle on five cars. It took five cars to haul one single pole. Then Talbots were the last ones to. Log, yeah, Talbot's Spur was right yeah. here, right yeah. behind yeah. the station here, it's right here. There was Talbot's, there was Rich Ply, there was a small one going the opposite way, right by the creek here. It went in, I'm trying to, Scott Paper, no, it wasn't Scott, was it Scott Paper? I think it was called Scott Paper, they used to load yeah, up cottonwood. cottonwood. Yeah, yeah cottonwood. that's Scott yeah. Paper. That was Scott Paper. Perkins. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was actually, the way freight job I was on like was like a what we call a local. We used to have way cars. You drop off freight at all the different places, but we also did all the switching. Like if a carload of logs had to get picked up and empties put back in, we did that job on the way freight. Prior to that, we had a logger. We'd come out of Squamish about six o'clock in the morning with 50 empty log flats, and we'd spot 25 up at Parker's. We'd leave some at uh, the 72 mile Needle or Alpha Lake. Yep. Oh yeah. And uh, then we'd come down into Pemberton here, and we'd switch. There's three or four pole yards. Or Pole yards, log spurs here. We'd switch here, head back up the hill. Of course, once you got up to Mons, you didn't need any more power to haul the loads. You could go downhill. We'd go back into Squamish, 50, 60 cars of logs a day. Then somebody wanted to put in another loading spot up at Mons, and he went to the sales department on the railway, and they said, We can't handle that. We don't have the power not thinking or not realizing he was already on the top of the hill. Yeah, like, oh, so the guy went out and bought some logging trucks and that was the end of and the logging hey, My brother got a job, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my brother Kenny, he drove a logging truck. Yeah. <laughs> but there was logging trucks. They were hauling to the rail sites anyway. Yeah. Like they'd haul and then drop yeah. the logs yeah. here and they were loaded here. Function Junction in Whistler, that was known as what? what? Well, there was an angle, trucks. pardon me? It was called Sprott. It was also called the Anglo-Canadian Camp because that was a lumber mill there. Mm -hmm. There was also L and K. No, L and K was up at Bonds. Yeah, that was, was below. Below. Van, Van, Van West. Yes. Actually, they used to load silver out of there too. Oh, the Function Junction. Yeah. This was through the forties and fifties. Ah, uh, no, that would have been later. They did it in the forties and fifties. Yes, but it was still going on in the sixties. So was that um, similar to Pemberton with lots of uh, switch tracks? Yes. Okay. Parker's had three sets of tracks there. Most Parker's people don't know where Parker's did. Parker's the north end of Green Lake. Yeah. yeah. Just before you tip down the hill. East, east side. Pardon me? East, no, east, side. east Yeah, east side of the lake, yes. Yeah. used to log down the hill to get it to Mars. And then just north of Parker's, there was a mill at the, what we call the 80 mile. It was the, uh, I think it was 52. Yes. What's 80 minus 38? <laughs> uh, th but there was a there was a mill there, a lumber mill, that we used to. Yeah, there still is. 
There's, I think the old beehive burner yeah, stuff, still Johnson part, is part still there. Right there. Uh, that was another uh, fairly busy place. And then another two miles down the hill, there was a pole yard uh, that a fellow by the name of Charlie so Lundstrom was pretty quickly after the highway went in because then uh, they could truck stuff straight to where mm -hmm. they wanted. We did still ship out stone, uh, big basalt columns out of Garibaldi that the landscaping outfits down in the States really love them for entrances to hotels and that, those big basalt columns. And they were Huckleberry Stone was loading them. In fact, that company's still around here, Huckleberry Stone. When was the why and all the switches taken out of government? Uh, that was actually after I retired, so it was uh, the 2005 on, yes. Yeah, the why, the why here was quite important. Well, we used to, there used to be a ramp up the tail. Yes, and the BC Rail wanted them gone, so they paid us to take them home. Well, to get rid of them, so we just loaded them up and hauled them home. Did you get the flags that went with them, the green no, and white flags? I didn't get the flags, but I do have from the Darcy station where all the tickets were put in, mm -hmm. and I used that for my cutler. <laughs> <laughs> Because that is all these little wayside stations, they used to have a green and white flag. It was called oh, for I a have flag one, stop. Just the green, it doesn't have white on it, I have just a solid green flag. No, it should, the Birkin train it, should, it should be green and white. Maybe Somebody's the white painted. Got worn all away. Could be, but it, they were half green, half white. And they hung on the side of the station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you wanted the train, yeah. which was a passenger train or a way freight, yeah. which I was remember, the yeah. he used to just put it up and stick it in a hole, yeah. 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 and that's when the train stopped. One came with oh, the Burson train station, yeah. but not with the Darcy. So you didn't have to do that here at Pemberton because this was a regular they, they stop. Had, Mr. Oberson was Warren Oberson was. Warner. Yeah. yeah, and then Jimmy Watson. Jimmy Watson, yeah. Jimmy and I have known each other since Jimmy was six years old. Wow, eh? <laughs> We're thrilled to have met you and talk about railroad. I personally got to ride the Bud train uh, just before it ended, uh, twice. I got to go to Little Wet once and I got to go yeah, to Pine Bluff. I was really struck by the friendliness of the personnel on the trains. Yeah. And thanks to Roy, I finally <laughs> was able to identify the conductor who uh, gave me and my girlfriend quite a tour, led us up into the front of the train. We got to meet the Brazilian engineer while well, Roy knew exactly who I was talking to. <laughs> since I the story. So he solved a long term mystery for me. Holy Ford was the conductor. Paul Varderizio from Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> I worked with Paul actually later after he was off the blood curse. Okay. And it's beautiful. You get a whole different view going through the Chesnus Canyon and mm. on the highway. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's fabulous. Amazing. Like, it is a tragedy that the yes, yes. rail is over. Yeah. Um, but I got to go on. It's nice that we got to get to relive it all this year because we talk about the railroad. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, the railroad isn't something I think about too often. What we used to do on, so things, on these passenger yeah. charters, we would stop the train in the Chequemus Canyon and then back the train down, unload the people, the, all the rail fans, unload them, and then they get to shoot pictures nice. and them across the bridge. And that one was taken by a fellow in Redwood City, California that sent it up to me. Well, that's how you get these That's how shots. I get, well, yeah, I, I can't get out there and take the pictures. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you work with a fellow by the name of Ed Cavanaugh? Oh, yes, Eddie. Yes, my neighbor in North Vancouver. Yeah, and, I worked uh, with Ed. I used to work at Cypress Lodge on Alton Lake. Mm -hmm. And Ed would be the engineer quite often on the train, and my mum would take. No one lived on the freight. Right here. When I was working in the summers, my mom would so go over and give him care packages oh, nice. to bring it up to the lodge, and he would stop, slow the train down, and we knew because he would haunt, right? Yeah. So, so slow the train down, and we'd all run out to grab <laughs> the kitchen as you run. And the groceries came up quite often to the lodge that way. Oh yes, that was that was part of the way for its job. We used yeah. to haul groceries to the a lot of the lodges, Rainbow, Cypress. There was uh, Alpine Lodge at Garibaldi was still in then before they got all carry about the barrier and shut down. Yeah. There was a little town site at Garibaldi. Yeah. Those were good times. Those are charters I worked. Yeah. We used to do a steam charter out of North Vancouver up to uh, 100 Mile House. And they used to do ones to Kelly Lake. <clears throat> the size of them. You see you standing beside it. 
<laughs> and that's, that's, that's not the Royal Hudson, that's no. the 3716. That one is still running in Summerland on the KBR, oh, that? Kettle Valley Road. Nice. It went over there and uh, they completely rebuilt it. The Hudson's sitting in the, in the roundhouse at the Squamish Museum, mm. but it oh needs, uh, the boiler yeah. needs to be redone and that's a major job, mm. major job. <laughs> they talk about getting it running, but it's, it's not practical. Because <clears throat> even if you get it running, Every five years, Transport Canada says you have to recertify it. There's no way you can recover your costs of getting yeah, it running uh, yeah. to do it again. How is KBR doing? KBR is doing quite well. Uh, they had their own mechanics in that. Room. We actually had that locomotive. Uh, no, not that one. There was another one so on that Shea one, that picture I had of me on the back of Caboose. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a different engine. But. Uh, yeah, I got to work with both those steam engines. We the, we actually took the Royal Hudson. See, the Royal Hudson is not practical for climbing grades. It's good for speed on the flats. We've taken it down to White Rock. I've had it down into the States because we have to go down to Cherry Point, Washington to turn it around. There's no Y at yeah. White Rock, so you have to go down on the BN That's tracks good. to Cherry yeah. Point, Washington. And when we got to the border, it was quite funny. I think guys must have shut down a couple of booths on the border and they climbed on the train because they just wanted to go for a train ride, the U.S. immigration. <laughs> and we had that locomotive up at 60 miles an hour, this, the Hudson down there. It's just going tick, 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 tick. Just beautiful. We're showing a video. We're showing uh, Twilight of the Rails, which is a documentary about the last passenger service um, and the people that were working for BC Rail at the time. There's some of their stories. It's a real tearjerker, so bring your Kleenex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that next Tuesday? This is next Tuesday at the museum. Okay. And on uh, August 12th with Eric Anderson, who's a local historian out of Squamish, he's going to do a presentation at the museum about the uh, railway charter that spurred the development of farms all the way up mm -hmm. the valley and why this happened. But then in the evening, he's coming to the library, but at, in the evening presentation, he's going to talk about Emily Carr's 1933 Travel by rail through this area. Wow. So two different topics by yeah. Eric on the twelfth. So that's good. Both. Yeah. And oh, thanks for your support of the program. This was our first tea and tales in the evenings. So thanks for coming. <laughs> thank you. And thank for, you. For those of us who work, it's great to have this. Yeah. yeah.